Hello there, welcome to another video of me putting a Saab 2.3 turbo in my UAS. I try my best not to release a video if I haven't sort of finished that chapter and moved on to the next one, but uh, shock horror, I've not finished this chapter, it's still ongoing. In the last video I sort of loosely promised that I was going to be starting the engine in this current video, in the next video, which is this one. Guess what? Promises, just like all my projects, are meant to be broken. Anyway, so the algorithm doesn't forget me, here's a video of me struggling with shit wiring. Okay, so I've just fitted the dipstick. Originally, the 9000 dipstick would hang off this bracket, which I didn't have enough room for. So I made this little alternative bracket to push it off to the side and then just used rubber flexi pipe. It's only like a plastic PVC pipe anyway, and that goes down to the sump. On the Saabs, the dipstick tube is the filler and where the dipstick goes. So that's where that is. This is off an old 8 valve 900, I think. So what I'd done was, because the min and max marks won't tally up to this sump, because on a 900, very narrow but deep on this engine, it's not. So what I've done is chuck four litres of oil in, made a mark on the dipstick, chucked another litre, made another mark, and then I'm going to use that as min and max. You might be wondering why I haven't just gone for the 9.3 uh, dipstick filler, which comes in between the inlet manifold and the head, and that's because it will not fit with a 9,000 inlet manifold. There just isn't enough room to get it through. See? So if you're not too up to speed with Saab B204 and B234 engines, you may not be aware that they share a gearbox bolt pattern with many 90s, 2000 era Vauxhalls. Now what that means is not only people like me get to run Vauxhall gearboxes in non-Vauxhall applications like Frontier gearboxes in UASes or Omega gearboxes in Scimitars, it also means you can put the Saab engines in the Vauxhalls. And why am I telling you that? Basically, there's a Facebook group called Saab Works, and that's predominantly Vauxhalls with Saab engines in them. Uh, what that then means is that there's people out there that offer plug-and-play looms, engine mounts, alternator belt relocation, pulleys, etc. Check it out. It's a useful page to be on. Uh, and one such person who makes some of this kit is a bloke called Elv, and he's helped me with a plug-and-play loom for this thing. Now I'm going to take you over to the scimitar uh, because of the way I've been working recently which is once I've had enough probably at like 9 10 o'clock at night literally just been turning the lights off locking up and going home. The place is a bit of a tip so the scimitar has become the workbench. Not really a workbench but the only place big enough I can stretch this out. This is my loom which Elva sorted me out as you can see, he's got all the inputs labelled up here, so starter, high and low boost switches, that gives me my oil pressure, all that sort of stuff. The plug for mapping it, relays and fuses for the O2 sensor, coil pack, fuel pump, etc. And then he's labelled up all these as well. So, perfect. That should make things much easier. And if you're wondering, Yes, it is real. Things have stalled a bit on the scimitar. If you're not up to speed with it, I started doing a seven speed dual clutch transmission swap on this. And it basically at the same time I had the comma to do, and then I've since bought the UAS and that blew up. So this has not been touched in a while. But as it is, it's got the Saab 2.3 turbo, a seven speed dual clutch transmission. It's got the prop shaft made over there. I weighed this, weighed 1099 kilos. And the idea is to get it down to a thousand and four hundred horsepower. I've been waiting a few days for this battery wire. I'm going to run that from the alternator to the starter to the battery. So on the back of the alternator, you need the big fat power wire going in, and then you also need that big fat power wire. Go into the starter solenoid and then you need them pair hooked up to the battery. So the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to do a little link wire between the alternator and the starter and then the starter to the battery. So this is the correct way to do it. Yeah, it's got to be, isn't it? Perfect. Ish. Then pause. Cutting pliers to strip it. Uh, 
And then I've got one of these. All right, there's both ends done. Does it fit on the van? Okay, so underneath I've run a link wire from the back of the alternator onto the back of the starter. Then I've run another wire off the starter, P-clipped it to the body, riveted it on over the top of the box, another P-clip. Then it gets a bit difficult to see, but another P-clip all the way up there, and then through a grommet, which is pre-existing, to the battery. And it's all high and far away from the exhaust. Right, I've just got the last crimp to do, which is a bit of a pain because of the way it comes through the grommets. You've got to put the crimp on in position. So I've got this loose vise and I'm going to make it work that way. Right, that was a little bit of a pain, but that is done. Still isolated? Yeah. Then that is just going to clamp to that. Like that, yeah? So one thing I think is pretty cool on the UAS is that the battery isolator is on the negative side. So you've got your negative terminal and this bolts to the vehicle and then once this is pushed and this is out, and that's the electrical system isolated. Normally you find you have your battery, positive battery uh, terminal, a short length of wire and then like a turn red battery off key right problem with that is is that if you were to short if you were to touch the body to that positive terminal even if your isolator is off you're still going to get a short circuit with this right the only way you're going to get a short circuit is if you bridge them two terminals the only thing carrying power is up to here the whole exterior of the vehicle is now isolated surely this is a better way of doing it if you know why that isn't commonplace on all vehicles and why we do isolate on the positive terminal normally, please let me know in the comments. If you know how much smoke is too much smoke in a vehicle electrical system, if you can let me know in the comments. I'm only joking. Uh, that's not right. Uh, I had two alternators sat on a shelf, uh, one of them had tits written on the back of it, so I knew that one didn't work. The other one, I was thinking, it probably isn't sat on the shelf if there's nothing wrong with it. So I thought I'll fit it, and then all the tit smoke came out, so yeah, tits. Am I going to get demonetized for saying tits? <sighs> I was really hanging out for that $1.50. Anyway, it's an acronym. Terminally Irreparably... Tits syndrome. So there you are. It's not even swearing. Right, I'm just going to turn this over on the starter. I've isolated the alternator. I just want to see if it pisses oil out everywhere. To do this, I'm going to jump the main power lead to the solenoid. Right, if you haven't had terrible old cars like me before, then you might not realise what I'm doing. So I'll quickly go through it. Starter motor, solenoid, this is a pre-engaged type, there's another type of inertia, I haven't got one here, but pre-engaged, this is the terminal which is connected to the battery, and then this is connected to your starter switch. What happens once this, this one, this big one here is always fed by the battery, this one here is only fed when you turn the start to the start, the key to the start position. When that is energized, the solenoid energizes and pulls backwards, there's a lever in here which is pivoted about there, that acts like that, pushing the gear out, which is under here, pushing that out into the flywheel, engaging in the flywheel. At the same time, once the solenoid hits at the back, there's a big switch in here, that then connects this main battery terminal with this terminal, which goes and spins the starter. What I'm doing is I'm bridging this terminal with this little spade connector that is energizing the solenoid and making it all spin. You can just run that one to that one and all you'll get then is the starter motor spinning but the solenoid won't have kicked it out so it won't engage with the flywheel so 
it will not spin the engine. Alternator oh, belt didn't fall off. I have to spat a lot of oil out yet. Plugs are up, by the way, that's why there's no compression. Nice. Now, as much as I've wanted to ignore it, I knew the wiring on the van was in a poor state. I was going to ignore it for now and just get it up and running and maybe revisit it in the future when the van broke down on me, no doubt. But the more I look, the more horrendous it is. Lots of twisted together wires. Uh, so I'm just going to add tape to them twists and crack on. Holy joking. I'm going to make a bloody meal of this. There's a crimp that's just uncrimped. Uh, then there's lots of scotch clips, etc. in here. Twisted together wires. And this is what I guess qualifies as a fuse box. Just fuse wire wrapped around some like baker light. Never really seen anything like that before. Basically, I've got to get rid of all that. I don't enjoy wiring. I can get through through it. I think I'm pretty methodical, but I'm not very bloody quick with it. Anyway, I've drawn up sort of a circuit diagram with fuses, relays, etc. So I sort of know what I want to do. And over the last few evenings, this is what I've come up with. So I have got one of these. I have wired in a headlight relay which is there and then for the fuses I have, let me look on the board I've got from right to left I've got side on one view, side gauge lights and hazards so they'll be on with the ignition off I'm going to need that, you know if I'm broken down and the engine and everything's turned off at least I've still got my hazard and side lights fuse 2 is left headlight, fuse 3 is right headlight fuse 4, main beam Five is heater on its own because that's quite high ampage. And then I've got wipers, washers, horn, indicators, brake, reverse in the final fuse. And then I've used a mixture of 12, 14, 16, 18 gauge wire. Pre-populated some of the relays so I can use them in the future. Yeah, it's all one colour because of uh, budgeting reasons and let's be honest, in my experience, anyway, if you're going to be chasing faults, you don't want to be chasing colours, you want to be continuity check everything. The usual disclaimer, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm making it up as I go along. These aren't how-to videos, come on. How to waste money, devalue vehicles. Anybody can do that. Look at this beautiful bundle of wires. I get, to, I get to a position on projects where I'm basically afraid to make a decision. I think the reason for that is that because I'm on my own and I don't really have many people to sound ideas off, I get to this point where I'm like, I'm not sure if you want to do that, and I get scared into not making a decision. But do you know what? It's the worst that could happen. And by the time you type your answer in the comments, it's too late and I've already done it. So let's just go for it. Do I need that? Where's this horrible bunch of wires here? All right, this. Okay, a few days have passed. I've started making uh, a fresh loom to go in and this is all the stuff I have cut out. Let me show you some of the good bits. We have lots of wires like this where the insulation has just fallen off. This was a, a, a live wire at the back of the ignition switch. Super. And then we have a lot of stuff with scotch locks all over it. Scotch locks on scotch locks on scotch locks and some of this melted wiring uh, yeah it's all going to come out well it all has come out and I'm just going to do the whole loom again just spotted this so this is one of the side repeaters pretty cool I like them uh, and this is the feed wire for it 
nice and bare. And then this appears to be the loom that goes to the back of the van. And just like this. I'm pretty sure that is for the repeater on the other side. So, so far all I've done is created the wiring for the headlight relay in here. But what I'm also going to do is add in this, which is a flasher relay for the indicators and the hazards. Basically, as you feed your 12 volt into that, it comes on and off, hence flasher. And then this, which is uh, just a normal 5 pin relay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run selectable low and high boost on this van, just like I did on the comma. Here's a little clip of it in action. brilliant. Uh, I'm going to stick a link up to a short video where I explain how I got that to work on the comma. But let me quickly tell you what I'm going to do on this one. I've got this switch which I've just <laughs> lost. Come on you great big tit. So I've got this switch. This was added into the van. I don't think this would have been a standard switch but on this, on the original engine it ran an electric fuel pump. Uh, and used to pull it on and the green light would come on and I'm going to keep that but what I'm going to use it for is I'm going to write on this green light something like LPT, low pressure turbo or eco which is a bit funny because this thing will probably only do about 15 miles per gallon anyway and once that's pulled it's going to be in low pressure so on the Saab ECU if you feed in 12 volts to two terminals which I'll, I'll tell you here One's brake and one's cruise control. You can use either of them. You don't need to use both of them. Once you feed 12 volts into them, the car thinks either the brakes are on, or actually, in a Saab, the brakes are on. The ECU thinks either the brakes are on or the cruise control is on, then it will not allow power to go to the boost solenoid, the APC valve, and you will only get wastegate pressure. In this instance, about 0.45 bar instead of about 1.2. So what I'm going to do... I'm going to use that relay, an 87A, which is powered when the magnetic field of the relay is not powered. You understand? So when you push this on and that relay is no longer powered, it's going to flick over and it is going to run a fan for my charge cooler. Press this button in, green light goes up, eco mode is gone, full boost, intercooler fan is on. Genius. One thing I've noticed quite a bit filming this particular video is that depending where I stand under my lights depends how the picture comes out and it looks like the camera's dirty. It's not. I'm just filming on selfie mode on a phone. Uh, I would like to improve the way I make videos. At the moment I literally film everything on my phone and I edit everything on my phone. Publish it. Uh, I've only just bought a laptop. Uh, but I would like to improve the way I make stuff. If you too would like to see me make better videos with a camera which isn't on selfie mode, uh, consider joining my Patreon. Thank you. Or consider buying some of them awesome stickers I've had made. Wow. 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 Okay, so I have so far extended these wires um, with a variety of 18 and 16 gauge uh wire doing uh, the trusty tie it to something on the floor method this wiring is going to run around the side of the bay underneath the radiator then back up through a grommet into the back of the dash the relay and fuse box is going to be mounted up under here and uh got my trusty book where i've just had to bloody continuity check the back of the hazard switch because I can't find a wiring diagram for it because I don't speak bloody Russian. Um, but I've worked out what I'm going to do with the hazard switch. Everything's a tip. Uh, do you know, and I did it, continuity check in with my multimeter that doesn't even beep when you check for continuity. Stop begging for money. 
Uh, I'm going to call it there for this video because it's gone on gone on for a bit. I'm making slow progress, and I just want to show you how cold it is down here. That's my solder paste. Catch me in the next video where I am going to be driving this up the Himalayas. Or other such promises I can't keep. Hopefully, next one, I'm going to get a star. Or an electrical fire. Thanks for watching. Bye.